Hi, everybody. Good morning, evening, um, afternoon, um, wherever you are. You will see me looking a lot to the left because my, my, my big monitor is on my left, so I'm looking to the side at it a lot. Um, it's not because I don't want to be looking straight at the camera. Um, yes, uh, let me see how I can share my screen. <clears throat> So, um, I'm Peter, I run the blog 2D3DAI, um, and today we're going to be talking about how to do automatic 3D modeling from a single image. Um, a couple of words to start with, um, this, usually I do these things uh, in a lecture hall or in front of a class, and I have interaction from the audience, so I know if I'm on the right path or not on the right path, and then people can ask questions or comment. Um, it's a bit different on Zoom. Um, you usually are all on mute, and, and then uh, sometimes somebody who's brave enough asks something or, or comments something. Um, I really um, um, uh, promote people asking questions because uh, I have even less interaction with you, so I don't know if what I'm saying is clear or not. So just feel free whenever you, you do want to say something, just, just speak, unmute yourself and talk. Um, I will be, I will be um, just you know, running across the slides in my own pace generally. So unless you say something, I won't know if I should stop or, or explain something more. So I have to have your cooperation here. People sometimes send a text in the chat. I see somebody also sent already a text. Um, yeah, I don't see the text. I, I, I have a problem with multitasking. I'm usually focusing on one thing and this will be explaining the things here and, and listening. I will probably not see the text until the end of the lecture. So either you, the person who has the question, just say it, with, you know, speak it. Or somebody else who says a question uh, via text, um, just raise it and let me know that there is a question that I should be addressing. Um, yeah, um, this is, by the way, also another reason we're doing this in Zoom and not via YouTube or Twitch or something else because, because I like this interaction that I get with the audience. I myself get a benefit from it. I can learn something new sometimes. Um, so yeah, that, that's good for us. Um, another thing I see Itamar asked about if I will share the slides. I will share the slides. Um, it, uh, to this evening, I have another, this presentation after it will end, I will share the slides that will be on the Reddit and it will be sent to the emails of everybody through the newsletter. Um, I will also put one of the lectures, one of the iterations on YouTube. Um, so you will also have it recorded uh, there. Um, and I'll talk about the other things that we're going to be handling on uh, later on. Just one second, there were a couple of people who had problems getting into this room, so I want to check if they were successful or not. <clears throat> I'm sorry about this, let us, you know, you can even look with me together, because I know they had issue one person, person was a bit uh, frustrated about it. Yeah, yeah, I just received it. One minute, thanks. Perfect. So we have that. Okay. Why don't I see everybody in the Zoom now? Where is the participants joining? I should actually also lock this this room after. Soon I will lock it. I want to see all of you better. Why am not am I not seeing you well? Maybe like this will be better. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And so I'm going to start um, a bit about me. Um, I have a first degree in statistics and operational research. I was actually studying for my master's in deep learning, which I stopped after I had all the background which I wanted. I didn't feel like I needed the diploma so much. Um, I've been working with um, neural networks uh, 15 years now almost, um, a bit before it caught on as a buzz when I was a teenager. Um, my previous startup, uh, we founded a company that does uh, automatic lip reading. 
um, using uh, neural networks, which is um, to understand what a person says through movement and visual input and image without audio. Um, after that, I was part of a founding team and chief architect of a company that does cybersecurity for hospitals and medical devices. Um, currently, I run a machine learning outsourcing agency and consultancy, it's called Abelians. Um, and I also write in my blog, um, I teach machine learning, I teach TensorFlow, I have different courses I run and I run this lecture also and others. Uh, a bit about the agenda for today. So, so this is a bit more technical than the previous talks I had. Um, I won't be explaining all the basic fundamentals, but I will be explaining a basic concept just to make sure that the audience, you know, everybody is uh, on, in tune with what we're talking about. Um, we will follow one specific research um, from last year um, that does uh, 3D reconstruction from single image. And while we're following this research, we're going to cover a couple of topics. We're going to first talk about how to reconstruct a 3D model from a 3D model. It sounds very simple, but actually it has a lot of uh, sophistication to it. Um, then I'm going to be talking, I'll touch a bit about convolution neural networks. Probably most of you know, but I'll, I'll, I think I'll give some cool examples that give even extra um, um, intuition into the subject. Then uh, we're going to transform to the world of 2D to 3D. Um, we're going to touch about ResNet a bit. Again, most of you should know it, but I'm still going to cover some basic things about it. Um, there is going to be a small uh, digression to an, another topic, which is Google Dream. I will explain what it is and we'll show some images and we'll see why it's interesting to talk about it. And, and then we're going to come back to 2D to 3D. Towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to be talking about guns um, and I'm going to be talking about um, creating new fake 3D models. And uh, I'll show a couple of more examples. Now, I am excited for this talk even more than the previous ones because this should be a more technical audience. So I should be getting hard questions, which I would, uh, I would love to get because this uh, will allow me to better improve also my knowledge uh, and uh, yeah. I want to see how I can, am I recording this? I think I am. Yeah, this is recording. That's good. Um, okay, so we're going to start. Again, just feel free to jump into the call whenever. Um, you can use also your video and your audio. This is why uh, we had that Zoom screening process. I wanted to allow people to use the video and the audio and, and, and to have this happen without having Zoom bombing. Um, I had to have that, um, that all registration thing that you all went through, which was uh, frustrating also for me. So um, the code and the project and the paper that we're going to follow is called Implicit Decoder. The archive uh, link is here. This is the number. Uh, on the Reddit group, there is a post that says uh, references to the 3D lecture. It has all the references for this, both to my blog post about it, um, they're Git, they're open source, um, everything, the paper, everything there, the ShapeNet uh, reference, ShapeNet is the data set that is used here. Um, so you can find it there or you can just print screen now uh, or you can look at the PDF when I send it. Now the gist is um, we want to take this single image here on the left. This is a synthetically generated image. We'll talk about it a bit more later and automatically from it, create uh, this 3D model on the right using a neural network. Now, in order just to understand these concepts, we first got to cover a couple of basic things. Um, we first got to start from 3D to 3D reconstruction, as I already mentioned. And to understand that, we got to understand, first of all, how 3D models can be um, represented in a digital form. So one, one type of representation is called a voxel, which is volumetric pixel. This is the equivalent of pixels, but in 3D space. Every point in space here has a classification if it's inside of the mass of the object or outside of the mass of the object. And this is a voxel. In this example here, it's a 64 by 64 by 64 dimension voxel. Point cloud is almost the same as voxel, um, but just with less data. It's not just all the points in the 3D space. It's a select few, maybe even random points. And each one is also classified as if inside the mass or outside of the mass. Point clouds are important, and especially in the neural network area, because they allow for better optimization of computation resources. We don't always have to go to all, over all the points in space. We can just select a few and go over them. And this uh, dramatically decreases the amount of computation power that we need. 
And a very common representation, another one is, is a mesh. And now I see the problems that I wanted. I don't have my notes. Oh, here they are. So a mesh is another representation in which um, there are polygons, many polygons in, in space that are connected with edges. Um, and the polygons are usually, not always, but usually are triangles that are just connected to form this 3D model in total. Now, another thing that we got to cover is that we have to have the flexibility to move from one type of representation to the next. Uh, I have more people joining in somehow, even though I locked this room. Let me just double check. I didn't lock the room. That's it. I'm going to lock it now. Um, so uh, we, have, we have to have a way to move from one form of representation to the other. So, um, of course, moving from a voxel to point cloud is kind of straightforward. Um, the other way, point cloud to voxel, we'll cover in the lecture. Um, but uh, two more interesting parts is how to move from a mesh to voxel. It's also kind of simple because basically what we got to do is just we got to sample points in 3D space and see if they're inside of the mesh or outside of the mesh. And there is a tool that does it. You can download it and use it. It's called Binvox. This is the link. Moving from voxel to mesh, it's a bit more interesting and more tricky. Um, so there is a good algorithm that helps us achieve it. It's called a marching cubes. On this YouTube link, you have a one hour lecture about marching cubes. Uh, it's a very good, very um, explanatory, very deep also lecture. I use it myself sometimes uh, when I need uh, some information about this. Uh, that's the best source of info that I found online. Um, also, Marching Cube is implemented in Python, in C++, in Java. It's implemented in many languages, a very common algorithm. Um, the basic idea of Marching Cube algorithm is to look at the voxel shape and always look at eight adjacent points. And because we're always looking at adjacent points and we're looking at which point is inside of the mesh and which is without, um, there is a closed set of possibilities for the points configuration. And because of symmetry, this closed set is even smaller because it's actually smaller by half. Now, how is it done? Um, for example, if you look at this square, at, at this uh, box here, um, by the way, if you don't see my mouse, just let me know. Um, if we look at this uh, box here, we see that the four boxes below, four points below are marked as inside of the mass and the four above are not. So the corresponding polygon uh, configuration for it will be two triangles connected um, here. Okay. And what we do is uh, when we run the marching cube, it's looking at all these eight adjacent points and then it has a sophisticated manner of aggregating them and aggregating all the different polygons that come out to create the entire mess shape. Okay, now we don't need to cover this. We don't need to cover this. Ah, yeah. I want to cover some basic terminologies just, just to make sure we're all on, in tune here. Um, so I would be sometimes referring to features. Uh, features could be anything from a single, uh, a single uh, color for a single pixel. It could be a numeric measure. It could be something categorical, male or female car, bus, uh, bicycle. It could be a one measurement of a signal in one time point, in one discrete time point. So for example, in the acoustic sense, this could be uh, how much decibel this, there was in a specific time point. It could be, and this is important, it could be an encoding of data. So if we cut a neural network in the middle and the output of the neurons there could be features for the next layer, of course, they could, they're encodings of the original input that the neural network had. Activation function should be familiar to everybody here. Um, this is um, a neuron gets as an in input from many previous neurons. It aggregates this input and then decides what to do with it next. This is the activation function. One common one is ReLU, which is just a positive function. It says if the input was positive, just send it over. If it was negative, send to zero. We see it on the right here, the graph. Uh, yeah, we don't need to talk about this. We don't need to talk about convolutions. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll touch about convolutions just to make sure. By the way, if, if these things are too rudimentary, also feel free to say, say, look, we can continue this. We know it. Um, it's okay. Um, so I'm just going to be briefly talk about convolutional networks. Original idea for them um, was from the scaling problem of, of a fully connected layers. So if we had even just uh, one, one neuron one, and one fully connected layer for an input image of size 200 by 200 by three, by three RGB, um, and we wanted to have some work done on it uh, with this one neuron, we'd have to have 120,000 weights 
for this very small, very simple network. And this is, of course, not scalable if you want to enlarge the size of the image or enlarge the size of the network. So we had to invent a new way of handling the situation. So convolution neural networks were invented. And, and I want to talk a bit about the, about the, the uh, why did I forget the word now? Um, uh, intuition behind it. So the idea is it's kind of similar to the way the way we look at the world around us. Actually, um, we have a very wide uh, scope of field, but if you notice when we're looking at things, our focus field is kind of small. We're always looking at a small part of the entire thing around us. And we're, we're making sense of that small area that we're looking at. And this always the small area moves around. And in our mind, we're able to aggregate what we saw across the different parts and combine it to a complete understanding of the field around us. Uh, now, this is a very similar nature to convolutions. Um, that's uh, what we do there. Again, I'm going to briefly cover these things. Um, so we just look at you know, different parts of the image using the same mechanism of, of looking, using the same weights. Um, for each part, we have an output uh, from the neuron, and we know how much, this, how much information and what information was there, right? The network is able to encode the information from the original image into, um, after the convolution. Now, usually what happens also with convolutions is um, we want to minimize and we want to diminish the, the input dimensions. So if this would be, uh, let's say, 200 by 200 pixel image, so maybe the first layer of convolution will diminish it to 100 by 100. But we also usually enlarge the amount of channels. So originally we had an RGB image. This will be three channels. We might enlarge it to nine channels or 10 channels. And within these channels, we save that encoding of the data, the, the semantic sometimes meaning and representation of what we saw before. Uh, yeah, I want to show a cool demo that gives more, uh, more intuition into convolutions. Um, again, just feel free to tell me if these things are too basic. Um, so, and we could just keep this if it is. Um, so this is a, this is a cool demo online um, of a trained network that is able to recognize handwritten digits. I'm gonna write here the number four. And we see this is my input here below. And the output of the network, the final output is up above. It, it recognizes the, the number four. The thing here that we see, this is a convolution layer, this first one here with six channels, six output channels. And, and what we see is that each of the channels is, is still kind of um, encoding the number four inside of it, but now in a different, a bit of different representation. So of course the whiter parts is higher activations and the, and the, and the black or darker parts are lower activations. And what we see, for example, in this channel, the, the interesting parts for the neural network will be the writer parts of whatever I wrote. It's looking on the boundary of the right side. And this one is more looking at the bottom left and the top a bit right, right? And this one is looking just at the bottom parts of what I, or what I wrote. And now we have a pooling layer. Uh, for those who are familiar, that's okay. For those who are not, it's not so important for us. And here we have another convolution layer. Now here, we, it's actually hard, much harder enough for a human to try to figure out if there's even any meaning here. It's hard to see that number four. Maybe here we have that number four up here. Maybe here, I don't think so. Um, but again, there's an encoding here, um, a computerized encoding that saves important available information about the original image. We're just not able to see it with our eyes. Later on, the network is, has um, two fully connected layers <coughs> and gets an output um, uh, out of 10 possible outputs, which one that I drew. Uh, okay, I'm gonna continue with the slides. Uh, so let's talk now about 3D to 3D reconstruction using convolutions. The basic idea is that we want to have a network that gets a voxel as an input, 64 by 64, diminishes the information, um, compresses the information as much as possible from that 3D representation, and then extracts, its back, extracts it back into a point cloud. <laughs> and how does it happen? Um, the full configuration is this, is this neural network is actually built from two separate neural networks. One is a 3D encoder, it's a convolution-based encoder. <laughs> this encoder gets a voxel and emits a, a vector of size 128. We will call this the Z vector. Once we have this vector, 
we combine it with one 3D coordinate in space. Um, one sample 3D coordinate. I think I see some text here on the chat. Let me just briefly look at it. Um, I think we could skip to the CNN. I'm sorry, well, <laughs> you gotta say it to me, otherwise I don't see the text. Um, he has mentioned it's hard for him to read messages in chat. We might, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So um, uh, coming back to, to our slide here. So we have the Z vector and along with it, we have a 3D coordinate in space, a three numbers, of course, because there's three axes. We combine and concatenate it into one vector of size 131. And this vector will pass through a decoder and the decoder is just a simple classification network that tells us true or false. Is that 3D coordinate inside of the object or outside of the object? And if we sample enough 3D coordinates in space, then we can reconstruct that, um, um, that uh, point cloud we see on the right. Of course, if both the decoder and the encoder are working well and, and the input is good and everything. And before we continue, I wanna talk about this Z vector for a second. What is it and why is it important? So one of, its, uh, one of its functions is to serve as a compression mechanism for the original 3D model. So we wanna have a way to compress the information as much as possible for efficiency of computation. Another thing, it's a representation of whatever was in the 3D shape, but in one dimensional space. Okay? So we got in 1D a representation of a 3D. <clears throat> it's also the input for the decoder, uh, for the decoder later on, and we'll see why it's important. It's, it's also a simple vector, numeric vector of 128 numbers ranging in the range of zero to one. So it could be 0 0.25, 0 0.9, whatever. And this is important. It's a result of our building and training a 3D to 3D reconstruction neural network. After we build this network and train it, we won't only have trained weights, we will also have a Z vector pair model for training. <clears throat> okay, um, let's talk about the encoder. So the encoder is actually a very simple convolutional neural network. It has one, two, three, four, five, five. That's it, um, convolutions attached to it. The first one enlarges the original input, which was uh, just 64 by 64 by one channel to 33 by 30 by 33 by 32 channels. And from here, we are enlarging the channels by two each time and diminishing the, the dimensions by two each time until this last convolution layer, which is actually just a basic, also fully connected layer, which gives us an output of uh, 128 numbers. Um, so uh, we can talk here about the, the structure a bit more. So um, the, the kernels here are four by four by four. So kind of small look all at each time, a different part of the voxel. There is a two stride each going on each time. This is to diminish, of course, the, um, the output size, the output dimensions by two. <clears throat> we have a bias for each filter, a bias uh, weight. Um, we use batch normalization and we use leaky ReLU as our activation function each time. Of course, in the end, we don't use a leaky ReLU. We'll, we use a sigmoid to have that zero to one range output. Okay, uh, the decoder part, it's also kind of straightforward. Um, we have the Z vectors and input concatenated with one 3D coordinate in space. Um, this uh, goes on to a fully connected, very simple uh, layer that emits an output of 2048 um, using uh, leaky ReLU as uh, activation functions for the output. And we also use skip connections. In this skip connection, we just take the Z vector Sorry, we take the full vector, not just the Z vector with the, all of, with the 3D coordinate, and we add it um, to the output of the next layer. And again, we have a fully connected network. Um, this it time it emits uh, 1024 um, outputs. And again, the skip connection. Again, again, again. And in the end, uh, we have again, fully connected layer with one output neuron, uh, which emits a uh, classification. Uh, this should be sigmoid here, a zero to one. Okay. Um, now the skip connections are important. We'll talk about it more later, but I'll also mention it now. Um, we will soon see how this will be a bit deeper network. So we're using the skip connections also for the gradient uh, vanishing problem uh, solving. I'm gonna talk about it soon. Okay. So uh, now once we have the, the architecture of the network kind of figured out, um, what happens is uh, in the training, it's important to notice. 
So we want to have a training process that gets uh, voxels. By the way, we have about 5,000 voxels for training. And each voxel should come with enough 3D coordinates in space in order to have a good training process done to create this point cloud we see on the right. Now, how many 3D coordinates? Actually, there's a lot of them. And each one is a different, um, is a different train sample. Each coordinate comes with a voxel. And actually, there is um, a replication of the same voxels many times per coordinate. And we each time run all of this through the network while we're training. Now, this is a lot of computation uh, resources required for this. So we want to be as efficient as we can with these points. And how do we do it? So first, we don't have to sample all the points in the 3D space. We can just sample a very small subset. Not so small, but small enough. So we can start just from 16 and third amount of points per voxel and have the network train based on this. So we start with random initialized waste and we start training until we reach uh, saturation. After this, we have the network trained for 16 and the third amount of points. This could be random selected points in space. Now we want to fine tune and refine what the network learned. How can we do this? We add more points. So now we sample 32 and the third amount of points and we run another training iteration. But this time we don't use randomly initialized waste weights, we used the weights that were already trained before. And again, we have a train network now, and then we do this run another time. Um, so just to give you an understanding of, of uh, somebody asking questions, guys, I see now the chat, but please don't trust that I will see it all the time. <laughs> what about improved performances done in peak, peaks to box, for example, at LSTM or GRE? So it's possible to have other methods. Um, it's just not used in this paper. Will it help to perform, improve the performance? Maybe um, the performance here is the best I've seen um, regarding accuracy, regarding computation time, I was just about to mention. Um, so to train over 5,000 voxels with this configuration of iterative training, um, it takes one full day, 24 hours on a V100 GPU um, virtual machine. It costs about $5 an hour to run. Okay. Uh, I'm continue. Um, so another thing to mention is um, we don't have to randomly sample those 16 in the third amount of points or three, 32 in the third amount of points. We can be more sophisticated when we're doing the sampling. And even more than that, um, we can be even more uh, economic in the amount of points that we sample. So instead of just going uh, brute force and randomly sampling, I want to bring a marker just to show you. Um, if you look at my video now, um, maybe we'll use this marker, better call it. Um, when we're sampling points in 3D space, we don't have to sample um, points in this um, blank area around it. And we don't have to sample points right inside of the core, right? It's not interesting in order to understand this shape. The thing that is interesting is to sample points right on the circumvent, right on the edge of the shape, where it's starting to change between there is mass and there is no mass. Uh, <clears throat> Itamar, I'm gonna come back to your question soon. So um, we wanna sample, we don't need to sample random, we just wanna sample the points on the edge of this boundary. Either they're inside or outside, but they're on the edge because this is where the information about the shape lies. So this allows us uh, to be smart in the way we're doing the sampling and also to be economical. So we don't have to really sample 16, uh, 32, two and a third amount of points or 64 and third amount of points. Or if we're going to look at high resolutions of voxel 128 and so on. <clears throat> this will, if we will sample it like this, we will grow at a rate of O of N on the third when N is the dimension size. But we can grow of O and N in the second when we're looking at a smaller boundary, we're putting another boundary to add the amount of points, while we're looking at points only on the edge and not just any random point. And I'm gonna show a uh, sell the algorithm to how to achieve this, uh, but first let me address Itamar's question. He asks, uh, thank you. Can you talk about the amount of data, how many instances you run? Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about it in a couple of slides. Um, yeah. So moving back to the cell, the code. Um, so let's first define an edge point and a non-edge point. Um, we see here, of course, a 2D representation, but imagine this being in 3D. Um, so an edge point is a point that if we look three points to its left, to this right, top, bottom, and forward, backward, <clears throat> there are at least two points which are marked differently. One is inside of the mass and one is outside of the mass. 
a non-edge point is a point for which all the points next to it are either all inside of the mass or they're all outside of the mass. And now we have an iterative process in which uh, we, we always start with that boundary. So let's say 16 in the third amount of points. <clears throat> so we start sampling every point along the voxel and each one we mark, is it an edge or is it not an edge? If it is an edge, we keep it. If it's not an edge, we throw it away. And then if we haven't, if we've finished all the points and we haven't reached that boundary of 16 in the third, we say, okay, good, we're not on the boundary. Now we can continue sampling random points until we reach that boundary and that's it. If we have passed the boundary, if there's too many points, um, too many edge points, then we're continuing to the next option, which says, okay, don't sample just any point, sample only the second points in line. So go to the first point, sample it, then the second, then the third, then the fifth, as, uh, seventh, and so on. And again, keep the edges, throw away the non-edges. If you haven't reached the boundary, perfect, continue on sampling randomly until you do. If you have reached the boundary, then go to the default, which is do just random sampling. This means there's, that, that there's so many edge points along the model that we, we can't handle it and we'll just random sample until we reach that boundary that we want. Yeah. Um, Itamar, regarding your question, um, so the data set, um, there's 5,000 training samples of models. Um, this is the limitation because this is about the amount of models there are on ShapeNet for training. Um, there is also used a thousand models for test and validation. For each model, we have, of course, the mesh. Um, it's centered on, where is this? Yeah, it, the mass is centered at a zero, zero, zero point. Y is the height axis. Z is the depth going back is positive Z. X is the width going right is positive X. This is just a basic shape net V2 um, annotation. Um, each mesh also comes with a corresponding voxel of 64 by 64. There is a padding um, of two voxels for each side. Um, point clouds are sampled for 16 in the third, which is 16 in the third, 32 in the third, which is two times 16 in the third points, and 64 in the third, which is, uh, I think, two times 32 in the third amount of points. And each point in the point cloud of, has, of course, the classification if it's inside of the mass or outside of the mass. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so uh, this comes back to what we spoke about. So if we want to do the point, uh, the 3D coordinates for 16 and the third, we do use 16 and the third really sampled points. If we wanted to do for the 32 and the third, we actually have two times 16 and the third. And for 64, we have just 32 and the third. <clears throat> this again is about 24 hours of run. Okay, let me just see what I have next here. Save. Yeah, any questions about 3D to 3D? Um, I'm continuing on to 2D to 3D otherwise. No questions. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Your name first? Yeah, my name is Baibha. Okay. So I have a question about the loss function that you use. So, how exactly is the MSE applied? You mean I'm here on the right side? Yeah. So what the, the final output of this entire network is just a classification of true yeah. or false, right? Is a, is a, the range between zero to one if the 3D coordinate is inside of the mass or outside. And as we mentioned, um, for each 3D coordinate, we attach it for the, with the voxel. This means the voxel inputs are, are duplicated many, many times, as many times as there are 3D coordinates, okay? And, and the MSC is just calculated, okay, we were expecting to have a mass, let's say this is a, you know, a score of one, um, and the output from the decoder was uh, 0 0.2, so you can calculate the distance, and this is, the MSC is based on that. Okay, and uh, if I understood correctly, the point clouds that you sample, they're closer to the edges of the uh, mesh, right? Yes. Uh, so does this generalize well to points that are far away from the mesh or not? No. As we, as we saw here, um, I'm going to go back on the slides. Uh, so we had this, this, uh, this uh, um, sampling structure, sampling pseudo code, right? So we defined an edge point and we said um, sample any edge voxel. So sample just an edge point. If it's not an edge point, throw it away. It's not interesting for us. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I got that. But what about a test then? Uh, a test set? Yeah, at inference. Yeah. Uh, so there's a thousand models. Point that is far away from the mesh. 
uh, we do the same type of sampling also for the test set. Ah, right, because okay. the sampling, there is no training for the sampling. It's, it's just a discrete algorithm for sampling. So it's okay, we can do it. Right, okay. Okay. Um, Itamar asks nice. another thing. Itamar, just feel free to talk really. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I now I'm talking. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Go ahead. I have, I have a question about the kind of the data. As, as far as I know, ShapeNet include the chairs and airplanes and uh, guns and balls and something like that. So you run yeah. just the the test, the training, you run just for the chair? What you're yeah. talking about right now is just for the chair? Because, you know, there is a lot of uh, differences between the lines in the object. Yes. Yes. I will explain. So um, I am talking about chairs just to have, you know, a flow of the talk. But this same process um, is done the same for, for, for cables and for airplanes. We're actually going to see it in a couple of slides towards, more towards the end of the lecture. Chairs here is one example out of the different categories. But we do train and test per category. Okay? We will train and test per chairs, we'll train and test per table, and per airplane, and per, per rifle, and, and anything else. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK. Okay, moving to 2D to 3D. I need one small break for me for my voice. You can think about more questions in the meantime. I want to start talking a bit about ResNet, even though most of you probably are familiar, but still I think it'll be interesting to talk about. Um, but uh, even before that, I'm going to start with our end goal here as we want to have a picture uh, 128 by 128 pixels, run it to a, through a 2D encoder now, not a 3D encoder, 2D encoder. From this encoder, create the Z vector. And from here on is the same like we saw before. With Z, this Z vector, we add the 3D coordinate sampled in space. And, and this here, I'm going to show you during inference time, during the validation test inference later on times, we want to sample not just any specific 3D coordinates, we want to sample all 3D coordinates in space. If we sample all 3D coordinates in space, according to specific resolution, let's say 64 by 64 by 64, and we have a good decoder and we have a good encoder, so we can have a good uh, understanding of where are all the pixels, all, all the voxels, right? Where are all the points in the, in, inside of the mass and where are points outside of the mass. So we'll have a big voxel construction. And then we could use marching cube to create from this voxel the mesh we see on the right. This is our end goal here. Mm. Now the decoder we've already trained before. We have it ready. We don't need to do anything about it. Z vectors we have per 3D model, they're already created for us. We save them aside after we finish the training of the previous neural network. Uh, so actually what we're left with is we're left with creating this 2D encoder and to be able to train it in a way that it will create good Z vectors. But that's it. And uh, surprise, surprise, this 2D encoder is basically ResNet. So uh, we'll cover just briefly what ResNet is. Um, it's an image classification network from 2015 by Microsoft. Um, the original motivation for it was to solve the problem of vanishing gradients for deep networks. So when we have deep networks and we're calculating um, gradients um, iteratively along the different layers, um, some, many times the gradients are in the range of zero to one and we have a multiplication of gradients as much as, as the more as we move up the layers. So the first sort of layers will, might have zero um, gradients, which does not allow um, for changing their weights in a way that optimizes the network and allows it to learn. So um, ResNet was constructed to solve this issue. Um, it allows to train hundreds of layers. When we go to hundreds of layers, they, they start also to see the problem vanishing gradients, but also computation time problem, but still it allows for a much high, higher number of layers. It uses skip connections, which we've already touched. I'm going to touch back to it again. Um, and the classification error rate uh, on ImageNet on back in 2015 already was 3.6% with ResNet in, in comparison to 5% human error rate. Uh, this was nice already back then. Today, ResNet is used in many different uh, architectures for many different things. Um, ResNet as itself. And also the idea of skip connection is used many, many times. I see it constantly being reused um, for deep networks. <clears throat> yeah, this is, uh, I, 
don't think we should be focusing too much, but I'll show it briefly. Yeah, so the top uh, network here, that's a 34 uh, layers ResNet using skip connections every time skipping across two layers of convolutions, right? This way we can save back uh, some of the gradient values and not have them diminish to zero. Now, uh, the basic idea of ResNet is to classify a thousand different classes of image. So there is the last layer has a thousand size output. And now I want to digress a bit to another cool topic and we'll come back to ResNet and 2D and 3D soon. Um, another research from 2015 on another deep network, but this time it was also a classification, image classification network. Um, but this time this was an inception network by Google Dream, by Google. Um, and they call this project Google Dream. And along with this network, Google asked, uh, the team there asked another question. They wanted to say, to see and understand what a network sees when it's looking at an image. How does it classify an image? Um, and, and the way they did it is this. They had the inception network trained to classify images and it was prepared, everything good and ready. And then they wanted to see how it's possible to, to see what a network looks at when it's looking at a banana. So now what they did is they took a just white noise input image, random, and insert into the network and see the results, the activations in the end, the output and, and, and the banana output, how high was it? And the trick was, okay, um, we're gonna train this process, but instead of training based on the weights as variables, training will be on the original input image pixel as variable. So we're changing and optimizing the input image pixel instead of the weights. And after many, many iterations, um, we can see the result here on the right and we see that the, there are indeed a type of bananas in the image, right? And this trick could be done to different things, not just bananas, it could be done to measuring cups and ants and starfish and parachutes and screws. And we can see that really um, it's possible to create images that look similar to what we want based on that trained neural network. Now, the reason I, I am talking about Google Dream and the reason it's interesting is um, it's, it's not only because we can create these, these types of images that show us the object, but also we can debug neural networks using this concept. And how do we do it? So um, what we can do is we can say, okay, we looked at the last output layer of the network and then we changed the input image accordingly, but we don't have to look just at the last layer. Uh, we can look at the first or the, or the couple of first layers, check out their activation based on an input image. We can see the input image here on the left. And the process that we wanna do is we wanna change that input image so that the higher activations on that first layer will be even higher and the lower activations will be even lower. Okay, we do an optimization on the image, on the input image, and we change it so that the activations are even more contrasting. And now we get the output here on the right. And we see on this output here that what is interesting for the network to look at is the boundaries of shapes and the boundaries of objects in the image. So this gives us a bit of uh, intuition to understand the neural networks on, on, on the first layers they're looking for boundaries of shapes and, and they're looking for, for different contrast of the image. And this is the, like the focus points of the network in the beginning. When we're moving up for higher layers and the, 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 the more advanced activations, it's starting to be less structural definitions by the network and more semantic definitions. So instead of just looking for shape boundaries, it's starting to look for objects and, and shapes in general in, this, in the image. So we see here the input on the left and the output on the right and see like that this, this dog is becoming more like a monkey and we can start seeing like circles in different areas and all sorts of things. Now, if we take this idea also to the extreme, let's see really towards the end, what happens on the activations there. And we're on the same trick. Uh, we, can, uh, we can see this example. Um, the input here was an image of clouds. And we were interested, um, we're interested in the later activations and the later layers of the neural network and we're changing the input image accordingly. We start to see that now what's interesting in the network is not just boundaries of objects, it's really not that, it's semantic understanding of what's inside of the image. It's trying to figure out what type of objects are seen in the image. Okay? So here we see that the network is looking for something that looks like a tower or, or a pagoda in a shape. And here there's this weird fox combined with a bird. And, and here there's the type of pig maybe with a bird or something, right? There's different shapes in the sky. 
which is kind of cool because it kind of reminds the process of a little kid looking outside of a car window, right? In the clouds and try to figure out shapes. Um, so similar idea here. <laughs> this, this trick can also be done not just for, for, for photographs, but also for, I'm sorry, uh, first of all, you can see here, I zoom in on those, uh, on those images. You can clearly see that there are snails there, right? And, and weird birds and fish and everything. Um, now what I started saying before is um, that, uh, yeah, I jumped ahead too much, huh? So um, I, this, this process of putting input images and seeing what comes out in the later layers could be for different types of input images. So if we put input images with horizon, the network might expect to see towers and pagodas, which really makes sense because if you train a neural network with towers and buildings and pagodas, most of the time there will also be a horizon in the background because that's what happens when you take a photo of a tower. Or with leaves, then you see also birds and insects. That means also that many times with images of birds and insects, there, was, there were leaves there. So the network is expecting to find birds and insects if there are leaves on an image. Um, and this could be done also with art uh, as input image, not just like a photo. And then we could get the psychedelic type of, of, uh, of results based on the input, right? Or this could done with, be done with something like this, like beautiful pasture. And, and of course, even I might expect to see um, uh, farmer's machinery and farming, uh, farming things happening there as much as the next. Uh, now, this last example I want to show you is a way um, is a way to create digital art, um, synthetic, completely synthetic art. Um, these all images they started. Um, uh, by the way, these images I didn't create them myself. It's taken from Google's, you know, uh, blog and everything there. But uh, the process uh, I will explain. So what we can do here um, is we can take a completely white noise image as input, random, and put it into an inception network. And then we run the same thing as uh, we're looking at the activations and we change the input image so that the higher activations are higher, the lower and lower. And we get, a, for example, this image on the top left. Now what we can do is we can um, zoom in into one part of the image, crop it, zoom into it, and run the same process again. And then we can get this image on the right. Now again, we can crop it, zoom into that part, and run the same process. And again, we get this image. And then and moving on and on and on, continuously, infinite amount, infinite amount of, of images are created. Now, it's a good time for me to mention another dig small digression. Um, um, originally, I started this lecture online two weeks ago. Um, I thought there would be like maybe 20, 50 people, but then 500 people registered. <laughs> So that made me understand that there is interest in seeing these type of uh, things happen online and these type of events really around the world. Um, so we are going to take this format and this infrastructure that, that has created, you know, with the help of you guys, with the help of this community and, and make it bigger and have more free lectures and more events happening online with uh, people from everywhere in the world. Um, one of the lectures that's already going to be scheduled, that's 99% going to happen, will be about digital art and neural networks. Um, it will be, I think, a two-hour lecture by a friend of mine who is a um, neural network specialist and also a digital artist, and it's going to be hands-on with Python code. Um, I'm going to send updates about that lecture um, once it's all set. Um, it's going to be sent via email. It'll be on our meetup and in the Reddit group. Um, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Pranav. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, what do we mean by higher activations? Yeah, um, I'm going to go back a couple of slides here. Good question. So, if we look at this ResNet, for example, right, this is the previous, the first activation layers here, right? Yeah. And, and, and the more forward, or sometimes I refer to them as higher by mistake, my mistake, the, let's say the deeper activations are here. Now, okay. a higher activation value will mean uh, that the output of the function was higher, and a lower activation value means the output of the function was lower. Okay, as in okay. more positive value. Can you repeat? Uh, as in more positive value, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like the output value, basically. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, one last example, um, 
the, the cool thing with this project is it really gives us to a tool set to have debugging of, of network training and, and network structure. So, so for example, here, um, we wanted to see uh, dumbbells, how a network sees dumbbells. And we see that the expected result is to always have an arm attached to a dumbbell, which means that during our training, there was a bias that photos with dumbbells usually came with a person next to them. Uh, yeah, so I will continue with 2D to 3D. And we started talking about ResNets and deep networks and all of it. So what we mentioned is that we have to have a 2D encoder that encodes a 2D image into our, a Z vector vector. And actually this is a ResNet based encoder, very, very similar to ResNet, just that a uh, pooling layer is changed to a batch normalization and leaky, leaky ReLU layer. And then that less convolution layer and, and fully connected layer are changed to a, a bit of different convolution a batch normalization and a sigmoid of size 128 because the expected output of this network is a vector of size 128. That's the said vector. That's it. And now once we have this network architecture, we want to train it. The way we are training it is uh, first we have to have a data set for training and this is a um, for a 5,000 training sample models, um, we have um, 20, for each model, we have 20 synthetic images taken and used in Blender to generate, taken in an image size of 137 by 137. Um, we run it with, I'm gonna just continue a bit more. We run it with random azimuth of plus minus 180 degrees. It means all the circumvent around the model. Um, we each time sample a random direction and take the photo from it. We also have a random inclination of minus 40 to plus 40. Um, the camera is always on a sphere on, on 1.5 uh, units radius uh, um, around the center. Okay? And there is one uh, light source, which is also 1.5 units um, from the center. Um, in the image, there is a padding of nine on each side. And then when we're doing the training, each time we do a different cut of this padding, a random type of cut. So there is a kind of not that invariance to shape and direction of camera um, for, uh, for the images. And of course, please remember um, for each model, we already have a prepared Z vector for our training process. So we have 5,000 Z vectors. Uh, and, and, and again, 20 images per model, per Z vector. <clears throat> now, during training, uh, we just take all these images, we crop them uh, again randomly according to that padding. We get a 128 by 128 pixel image. Um, we run it uh, through the ResNet architecture and we expect to have a Z vector. And here again, we use a loss function, an MSE loss function. And we have a trained uh, 2D encoder that is trained to create Z vectors from an image. Um, this uh, training process takes about two hours on a V100 GPU, uh, that same one that we spoke of before. So just two hours basically to create 2D to 3D after we have 3D to 3D created. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, I had a question. I I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, okay. uh, uh, so what did you uh, use for like generating this, uh, this uh, mesh for uh, like not, not like displaying this mesh and like regarding the lighting and like the camera simulation, the computer graphics. So mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, because that will be very, this, it should be like really sensitive to that, right? Like which angle the, the light is facing, which yes. I like from, right. So, uh, what is, so what exactly should be the procedure for that? So you're saying um, there is sensitivity of the model to the light and, and what is the procedure? So we actually have this procedure in here. We have light coming from one specific spot, uh, but we're taking images of the models from different locations, right? Um, so we do have different variations of light emissions. It's not real world type of imagery. So you don't have all the types of spread of fluorescent light and sunlight. We're using here sunlight, blender sunlight, um, so, um, um, synthetic sunlight. Um, and there's of course no occlusions with other things in the scene. That's not a natural real world image. So I'm, and I'm right. gonna to refer to it a bit later also to explain um, a bit more about research done with natural scenes. I see. Uh, so yeah, so, so you simulated the cameras and all in Blender, I think, right? Yeah, everything is Blender simulated. There's nothing um, real life here. It's all via Blender. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, yeah. And I have another question. So actually you're training the, this uh, neural networks twice. 
separated just one for the encoder and the other training for the decoder? Exactly. Why don't you train all of this CNN together? <clears throat> because in order to get Z vectors that can um, encode 3D inside information, get one dimensional Z vector that gets inside and encoded 3D information, you can't use images for training. You gotta use 3D for training, right? Once you have that Z vector being able to and hold information about the 3D construct, then you wanna create an encoder, a 2D encoder that encodes from a 2D, 3D representation, a 3D representation of that Z vector. That's the trick, that's the cool trick happening here. Otherwise, if we wouldn't have the 3D models as, as input training in the beginning, we couldn't have this encoding of 3D information in 2D image. Mm. Hope this answers okay. the question. Okay, thank you. This is the elegance of this paper. I've been coming back to somebody asking about LCM and Jerry. Things are possible here, but they use a different method um, in order to be able to decode image, uh, kind of cool, cool way to go about. Okay, so um, coming back to what we started talking, and now once we have the 2D encoder trained, we use the previously trained decoder, um, we create Z vectors, we sample 3D points in space along all the voxel, we get a voxel, and from it we create the mesh. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a bit about accuracy measures and, and how can we say, okay, we have good reconstruction or, or bad reconstruction. So our, uh, you know, guys, uh, the classic ways to have accuracy measures, they can start with just an MSE score, move to precision recall, right, uh, F1 scores. We can just say, okay, we get, basically the network is creating voxels or point clouds. And for each one, uh, during testing, we know which point cloud we expect, which points in space should be inside of the mess, which not. So we can start having the regular calculations uh, for accuracy, um, as we all know. Uh, we can also use IOU, right? Just check all the point cloud, all, all the points that are overlapping between the ground truth and the and the prediction, and 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 uh, divided by the union of these amount of points. Um, and there are a couple of more ways to to measure uh, accuracy. This will be chamfer distance and normal distance. Both of these measures, what actually they do is they say, okay, we want to look at this, the closest point clouds between the ground truth. And, uh, and the prediction and then sum over all these close points and also um, kind of have a, a weighted average on the distance between these all close points. Um, these are the straightforward way um, to do, um, uh, you know, measurement between the distance of a ground truth model to, sorry, I'm going to close my window here one second. Sorry about that. I think I think this noise was bothering you as much as it was bothering me. Um, so coming back, so these are kind of straightforward, very geometric ways of of trying to figure out accuracy. But look at an example on my video for a second. We have these two markers, kind of similar in structure, right? If we look at all those methods I showed you, if this is one marker on the other, then okay, this let's say this is the ground truth, this is the prediction. The result will be yeah, okay, that's high accuracy. But what happens if I do this comparison, right? There is a big distance between the points on the tops here and the points on the top here, right? And the IOU in this case also not so good, right? There's a small intersection. But these are basically the same models. They're basically the same structure. How can we, how can we, um, you know, um, what's the word? How can we um, take this into consideration when we're doing our accuracy measure? Now, this is another thing I like that this paper we're seeing here that I didn't see in others so much is that they're referencing this geometrical, 3D geometrical issue. How did they do it? Uh, yeah, we first, before we continue to how they do it, let's talk about another motivation. So not only do we want um, our, our accuracy measure to be able to account for, you know, rotation, right? Translation, which is movement, where is the center? and scaling how large is this output, we want to also want it to be fast, type of fast calculation that we could scale it with uh, as many amount of models that we have. So, so how, do, how can we achieve this? 
So we can use what's called uh, light field descriptors. Um, you can search a bit about this more online. Um, if anybody wants, I can send you also references. The basic idea is that we want to have 10 uh, silhouette images um, from different angles of a 3D model. So we take each time we look at a different angle, and from it, we take 10 different images around the model based on that original angle. So we get 10 different uh, decatrons. I hope I'm spelling it right. And this is a giving us 100 images of one model. Right? And then what we want to do, we're actually comparing those images of the model between the ground truth model and the predicted model. And the way we compare it is also, we want the comparison of the images also to be scale invariant, translation invariant, all of these nice things. So we're using two types of descriptors based on these images. We take these images and we transfer them to using Fourier coefficients and Zarenki moments coefficients. Both give us numeric values of the shape that's in the image. The Fourier gives us the contour representation and a numeric value, and the Zarenki gives us a more of a regional base of where do we have holes, when don't we have holes, the shapes of it. And we use and we compare the coefficients between the ground truth and the target model. That's what we're comparing. And if the distance between the coefficients is low enough, we say, okay, it means really the shapes are close. And this is, both of these things are also invariant to scale, translation, uh, uh, rotation. So we can say, okay, um, we got really two models that are similar based on their real inherent shape. Um, again, these things, uh, it's a bit more mathematical stuff also. You can find it online if you want. I can send you the references to papers if you want to read more about it. Um, just for us for now, so you understand, comparing two models um, using a tool that is, is available. Um, you got to download it, but it's available online to download. It takes about a couple of seconds per, per pair of models, if I remember correctly. I have a but question. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is all happening after the training is over? No, this only happens in, in test time. Training is with uh, using MSE um, loss and value. Okay, so uh, we're not actually minimizing the silhouette distances, right? No, we're not. It's also not, uh, you know, it's not differentiable. <laughs> uh, so there's something called neural rendering, which is differentiable, and you can use it to minimize these distances. I just thought it would be cool to say that. Could uh, you so could you send maybe, us reference? Yeah, sure, I could do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, if, if the best thing will be just post it on Reddit. If if you are on the Reddit uh, group, uh, yep. just post it there as a process. Sure, I'll do that. Thank you. Yep. Mm. Okay. Compare. So yeah, we talked about this. Yeah. Um, now coming back to Itamar's question. So of course this could be not done not only for, for uh, chairs, uh, also for tables. On the right side, that's the ground truth. Second column on the right, this is the result of uh, reconstruction from the implicit uh, decoder network. On the left side, this is the images for input. And not only tables, but also vehicles. I like um, a couple of examples here. This truck here um, that doesn't have a backside and we see in the reconstruction, no backside and also on the ground truth, they're kind of similar. And also this uh, cabriolet type of car uh, with the spoiler on the back, we see it nicely here. Um, another example would be with airplanes. Um, I like this fighter jet here. Um, I don't know, somehow I always like the 3D model of the fighter jets, they look cool. So we can see a very nice reconstruction here, very similar to the ground truth, even maybe slicker than the ground truth. Um, These images yeah, are all from the text text? Oh, 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 can you repeat? Sorry? Yeah, are these images all from the test set? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, you can yeah. go ahead with that question. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so, I had a question. Uh, like, did you, uh, does the model also take into account the the pose and the orientation? Like the, the way the data was recorded was very organized. Like the the it was like from like a sphere and like a specific azimuth angles and stuff like that. So does it also uh, does some kind of like SFM like structure from motion at, at the beginning to like set it as a prior? So if you remember when we spoke about the three D model data set, I'll go back to the slide. Um, uh -huh. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, One second, we'll find it. It's here. Oh, there we go. 
So and it, here I mentioned that the models are very specific in orientation scale, yeah. right? Um, zero, zero is the mass center, uh, Y is height, everything. Uh, the reconstruction is not in a variant to scale, um, translation, and rotation, mm -hmm. okay? Reconstruction will always be with Y being height, Z being the, the um, depth, and X being width, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and the scale will also be the same all the time with the reconstruction. It is invariant on the image input side for, for scale, shape, and all of these things. Uh, so what I meant was actually, to, to, uh, that can the model be actually a help if they, we generate these kind of uh, these images uh, and we do some kind of structure from motion from these uh, test images? So I think, can, can't this be actually improve with the, that kind of thing, like the, some classical uh, 3D vision stuff? I'm not sure I'm following you. Could you explain? Uh, so, like in, in the in the test images, uh, like you have like a test set of test images. First of all, uh, does the model know that if this that, if that this test image is connected from this particular angle, or does it not? No. Uh, no angle information is given. Uh, Just okay, an image. Okay. Right. So even even without that, I think with, with some feature correspondences, like using like regular geometric techniques, you could like construct like a. Uh, really rudimentary model using some uh, 3D, the, using like bundle adjustment techniques, I suppose. So uh, I think this, yeah, this thing could, could actually be improved if, uh, if we have like a lot of images. If, if we like have like a dearth of images, definitely that, that then that would be an uh, issue. But I think if we have like a lot of images generated from this Blender model, I think that could be a really useful contribution, I suppose. So, so you mean so not you, just twenty, but more more images than twenty, or? Yeah, no, not even like even twenty could be enough, I suppose. Like uh, generating like a sparse sparse point cloud, uh, like sparse point cloud out of the images, and then using uh, like uh, training a model around those. So, so, so it, incorporating both to the uh, the projection and the three D data into the content. Mm. Yeah, I'm just I'm not... like if, if if it could be a viable thing to do, I suppose, like uh, because a continent that takes into account both the point, the uh, uh, like any SFM pipeline, if it reconstructs a brief point cloud and like uh, also takes into account the projections on like the virtual cameras, like takes both into account and uh, maybe. So, so what you're saying, if we add as features that the, the the parameters of the camera, it gives us more information to better reconstruct. If I'm understanding correctly. Uh, not the features of the camera. Like I'm saying, like uh, the SFM and SFM pipeline all, already like uh, takes it, like calculates the like the parameters of the camera. I'm saying the, the like a rough reconstruction of the like the structure itself. I'm so, I'm saying like, can can that be fed into the because the thing is like the number of points in that uh, reconstruction is usually not fixed. It can be, it can be like 200, can be like 2000. So it's like a very variable kind of output, right? But we're sampling, so, if you remember during, during validation and test, we're sampling all points. It's not really a point cloud anymore. It's a voxel. We're sampling all points yeah. in 3D space, all the 64 uh -huh. by 64 by 64. When we do, re when we do tests, when we do training, yeah, we sample less because this is, we are, because we're, you have, we have computation resources limitation. I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, then moving on to guns. We talk about accuracy measures. Yeah, done. So quickly, I'm just going to show this nice example. All these images here are fake. Maybe may, many of you know this website. It's called thispersondoesnotexist.com. It's a website that I like showing anyways, even people who are familiar, just because it's cool to see. Um, I'm going to be pressing refresh. Every person appears here doesn't exist. It's all fake. Uh, kind of freaky and cool at the same time. Um, so um, we can use the same mechanism. Uh, just ask me if you want me to explain how guns work. Otherwise, I'm not going to. Um, we can use a similar mechanism to create uh, 3D models, fakely generated 3D models. I'm going to play this video as an example to you. All the airplanes here are, are not existing before as 3D models. They're all new, generated by a network. And uh, if we move a bit further up, uh, we could see uh, old school type of models also. And then again, jet fighters and all of these nice things. How does this happen? 
The nice thing that uh, we have is we have a decoder that decodes Z vectors and we have Z vectors for real models, right? So what we can do is we can create a gun that creates new Z vectors, but fake now at, at this stage. And then it could create these two Z vectors for these two corresponding models, um, which we use the decoder to create from these Z vectors. And then as usual, we have a linear transformation from the one vector to the other using an alpha that is ranging from zero to one. Okay. And we can get this kind of cool thing that happening. Um, just ask questions if you want, otherwise I'm gonna continue. Uh, we have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna show you this thing. I'm gonna show you a research by Google also for 3D modeling, a bit different. So, so the team here, um, they didn't do 2D to 3D per se. What they did is uh, they created three types of um, encoders. One is a texture encoder, the other one is a viewpoint encoder, and the third one is a 3D model encoder, which is kind of straightforward. And what they have is then they have a, um, a generative adversarial network that was trained to take all this encoded data and, and create from it an image. So in this example here, we see that the left images are, they're taking an image of them and then we understand what the texture is, we're encoding the texture, and then we paste that texture on the models on the top with the viewpoints that we see on the top and we get this result. This looks kind of cool, but yet kind of simple. And then when we're looking at cars, that's kind of more interesting because we here we have an encoding of the texture, one encoding that encodes all the information about the wheels and the headlights and the grill and everything. And then we can, again, from this, encoder, from this encoding in a 3D model, generate a new image, which looks very much like a new type of car. Um, and, and this could be done also, we could, uh, what we can do is we can shape, we can keep two of the encodings intact, for example, the viewpoint and the shape, but only change the texture, and we see this on the bottom here, or we can just keep the texture and the viewpoint, but change the shape, uh, all this plane, and also the same for cars. And the last thing that I like to show is um, we can do that linear transformation that we saw with the airplanes also here. We, if we do the linear transformation on the encoding of the texture, for example, then we can get the chair changing the texture from this dark one to this brighter one, or we can change the shape also, right? Uh, we'll consider the linear transformation of how the, cha the shape evolves, or we can change both simultaneously, both shape and texture. And the same with cars. This is kind of cool because we can see how we can move from a more type of uh, family car, let's say, to a more type of sports car or different sports cars with different textures. Um, we have five minutes. I'm thinking if I'm going to show more things or, or wait for questions and then have concluding words. Um, a last example that many people here will be interested in. Um, this is called Google Experiments. Um, Google Experiments is a huge repository. Um, I'm going to click on this link here. Huge, huge repository. If you click here on Experiments, um, there's a never-ending scroll of different projects to do with, with artificial intelligence and art. This one, for example, is stick figure um, choreography. So you have different, uh, different stick figures there, static, and you can pick, let's say, three or four different um, orientations of body and you can press play and it will show you how it will look like in a dance. Um, or many, it's like there's really, I think, 30,000 projects here for everything you want, you can think about. Um, I like showing a specific example, cute one, it's called AutoDraw. This is a doodle recognition example here. Um, so I'm gonna paint for us a star. Um, and, 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 and the software knows to recognize, okay, it looks like this type of logo or this type of icon, and you can use it later for whatever. If you do logo creation, you can use it for logo creation. Um, and, and also, it's all, if I remember correctly, open source, and you can look at the code and use it, and all of these nice, nice things. Um, so Google Experiments, nice place to be at. Um, more things for automation. We can, that's the last one, let's say we will cover. Um, so this is uh, this research here, uh, very hard one. It's about 70 pa pages in this paper, a lot of math stuff going on. Guns also, but not only geometrical calculations, a lot of things happening. Um, in order to be able to take an input of a texture that could be infinite, most of the time it's biological type of texture, and automatically create it at a larger scale. So we see this on the left here. 
and we have this tree stem that we can enlarge as much as we want here on the right. Um, yes, I think uh, it's enough for us for today. Uh, uh, style transfer, oh, you know, about that. I'm gonna show you, maybe people here know about this, but the idea here, there's two neural networks. One is able to encode the style of an image. The other is able to encode the structure. And then third one, which is actually based on that one that encodes the structure, is creating this image with the style that we wanted. And, and just like one And now, my here, dear, as you were saying... I will show you... Oh, yes. I was sitting C, A... Just half a cup, if you don't mind. Yeah, here. Come, my dear. <laughs> don't you care for tea? Why, yes, I'm very fond of tea. But... If you don't care for tea, you could at least make polite conversation. That's a cool combo here. Well, I've been trying to ask you. I have... Oh, I'm sorry about this. Bummer, I wanted to show you what was interesting there. Um, I'm so, so what I like about this combo here, the style of this image with the, with the circles is exactly according to the eyes with the bunny. So you, you, you can get a cool, cool way to create really new and interesting views of different things when you're using these types of tools. Style transfer, I think, is already existing for a while now. It's not using guns here even. Um, just combining uh, encodings from two different... Um, ways of looking at an image. Yeah, so this is my contact info. Um, I'm available for questions now, and I will have a couple of uh, concluding remarks after the questions. Feel free to ask whatever, otherwise I'll just talk a bit more. Yes, hi, hi. Uh, I have a question. Can you return back to the GAN model that you mentioned before? Mm -hmm. I just want to be sure Told you well, so you you actually make a three z vector, three z vectors, input to the gun. The gun creates the z vector, so so our generator network on the gun side creates is is trained to create z vectors, but these z vectors are not connected to any real three D model that was existent. It's just new fake z vectors, and because we have a prepared and trained decoder. We can take these new Z vectors, put them in the decoder, and get an output a 3D model. Yeah, the decoder you trained last uh, last paper. Yeah, from it's the same paper, by the way, but it was a previous iteration. Yeah, ah, it was okay. turned on the 3D to 3D. That's another. Mm -hmm. This comes back to okay, why not just train and create Z vectors from image? Uh, because then um, maybe it will be harder to create this type of process that doesn't even involve image inside of it. Okay, and the last function function for the, those three. Uh, three z vectors is the same, there is the mean score error loss function? In this case here, on this slide? Yeah. It's, it's not a loss function at all, this is just a um, 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 linear transform. So you have an alpha ranging from zero to one. When alpha is zero, the result will be, there is no z1, it's only z2. So mm -hmm. the z vector that we get is output is z2. When alpha z2. is one, it's just z1. When alpha is a half, we get half of the model of Z1 and half of the model of Z2. So this will be this model here. Okay, I see. But when you're training the encoder for forget the Z vector, yeah, you have to use the tree, the same uh, loss function. Um, the same I'm mechanism that generate the Z vectors, the Z vectors. Uh, no, no, because when we're training, um, if we're talking about guns for a second, let's, let's just cover what guns are and how they work. So, so when we do guns, this is for fake images, but imagine the same for the Z vector. And um, when we're training a gun network, we have the generator network and we have a discriminator, right? Okay. The generator is, is trained to generate fake. And, and the last function for the generator is how many, this, how many fake images did the discriminator, um, was the discriminator able to find out? The less images the discriminator finds out, the better the GAN network is, and uh, the generator network is. So it's a completely different loss function, right? It, it, it compares like classifications of, of Z vectors or images. Is the classification uh, fake or not fake? And what was it supposed to be? And what okay. are your uh, random inputs to the generator network? Random Python generated numbers. <laughs> That's the thing with, with GANs, you always it's have not random. It's not taken from the Z vectors? No. The way that guns are trained is that you have the generator network, which starts off with, um, with uh, of course, random initialized weights, and you have a discriminator network, also starts off with random initialized weights. Now you have, let, let's talk about the image as an example, okay, and then we can talk about the Z vectors. Let's focus on image in this case. 
So when, while you're training, you have samples of real images. You mm -hmm. have samples, for example, of real people, and you know that are real people because you're training, it's training time. In the beginning, because both networks are randomly initialized, the generator network is not creating anything of value. It's creating basically white noise. And the discriminator is also not creating anything of value. It's not recognizing anything of value. So it's recognizing, let's say, half of the time an image is fake, half of the time is real, uh, without any sense. Okay. Now, the optimization goal of the discriminator is to be able to predict better if an image is real or fakely generated from the generator. And the optimization goal of the generator is to be able to create fake images so that the discriminator is not able to predict which is true or which is not. Yeah. It's a kind of a tug of war game they're playing between them. Uh, one is trying to win over the other each uh, training iteration, each training epoch. Okay. Um, and, and, and what happens is that while we're training, both become very good at their task. The discriminator becomes very good at, the, at, create, at, gener at um, recognizing fake from that. The generator becomes very good at generating fake. So both become very good. In comparison to one another, maybe they're not so good, but in comparison to you know, a fake generator in general, they become very good. And in comparison to a fake uh, discriminator in general, they become very good. The construct here is taken from game theory, from min max games. Okay, uh, one is trying to win over the other to minimize the result of the other while maximizing his own. It comes from this area, it's like um, uh, you know, uh, from game theory. Okay, so actually you use this GAN architecture for generate the Z, the, Z, the Z vectors. Exactly, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Anybody? Yeah, what's the uh, architecture of the generator that you use in this GAN? Uh, three fully connected layers. That's okay, it. so no convolutions, right? No, nothing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. It's very simple. I think three, maybe two. Huh? Uh, yeah, I was looking at the post on your blog regarding this the deconstruction uh, thing. You talked yeah. about the photogrammetry software, how they could be using uh, this uh, thing like for, uh, for uh, this kind of research for like like handling things like the, the, the parts of the image that are not exactly visible. So, uh, so you talked something about like, occlusions in the image. So, uh, what yeah. what do you think is like the state of the art? Of, in that ah, so so uh, it's actually good you reminded me I forgot to answer one question that happened before so so what happens if we have uh, real world images with occlusions and we're different lightings there is research in this field you can also see it on my blog referencing one it's called mesh RCNN um, it's by Facebook um, Facebook also a couple of months ago uh, came out with a, a, a software for PyTorch it's called PyTorch 3D this is for 3D reconstruction. It's actually, that software is based on that, on this article, on this paper. Mm -hmm. um, and they tackled there that problem of real world images with occlusions. Uh, you can read about it more there, but the way they do it is first, they have uh, image segmentation in which they segment a different part of the image to the different objects. And based on this, they can handle better occlusions and understand better where the object is. And, and also, I just don't have, you know, it's a full paper to go over and understand. I don't have it prepared here to present to you, but you can, you can just go over that paper, Mesh RCNN. Yeah, sure. Now, I will mention, um, I, I have reservations with this paper. One of the things that I didn't like is I couldn't understand why their accuracy measures are relevant and good. Um, they say, I think somewhere there that they're the best or something, they're state of the art, like every research says always. I couldn't understand why and, and what makes them so. They did have a cool way to handle uh, real life images. That's true. You will see that the reconstruction quality there, just visual when you're looking, is not as good as we saw here. Um, but yeah, um, that's one example. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. I'll take a look at that. Sure, you're welcome. Um, I'm gonna stop the share and gonna continue talking about a couple of points, but I think still feel free, anybody who wants to ask a question, feel free to ask. I just have a couple of things I wanted to say towards the end. I'm going to open my, my notes here. Um, so, so first of all, again, thank you really everybody. Um, kind of cool to have a small, uh, small um, community happening here. Um, we are going to do more things. And, and if somebody here teaches or has like knowledge in a specific area, be it in, in visualization or digital art or, or machine learning, and, and if you want to share your knowledge or teach and, and, and have a lecture, let's talk. I would love to have it happen. Um, of course, feel free to share on the, on the Reddit group. Um, 
this is a group of people that have a specific interest, you know, so you can have a lot of input from many people. Yesterday, one of the guys in attendance, he, he's doing a PhD in particle physics, and, and they're also working with point clouds, but point clouds that are present energy emissions from type of atom that's being struck with this type of energy. And he's also trying to do 3D reconstruction. So we had a whole half, half hour chat about that, which was kind of awesome. Um, so really just feel free to share whatever. This is super open for everybody. Um, I am currently working on another project. I'm going to post a blog post probably next week about it for post estimation. Um, using a kind of a state of the art network from last year. Um, it's going to be nice. I'm going to, I'm going to also share it on the, on, on the newsletter and on Reddit. Um, yeah, I, there is a high chance I will send a Google form for feedback and, and other questions. Uh, I would love you guys to answer. Um, it's a good time to mention this happens because there was so much engagement and, 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 and interest from, from the world, you know, from the audience, from you guys. Um, in order to make this happen more and more often, we will have to have this, you know, engagement happening so we understand it is something that gives value to people because doing this for free, you know, it's nice, but if it's just 10 people looking at it, it's, it's not so valuable and interesting for, for us doing the presentations. Um, so, you know, your engagement is welcomed and even necessary. Um, uh, one last thing, um, I did do a survey with some of the people regarding how to manage this group and where to manage it. Um, there were a couple of people who specifically asked to not do it on Facebook. And because we started from Reddit, this, this is going to continue on Reddit um, and, and the discourse will be there. I'm not going to open a Facebook group anytime soon, probably, unless something drastically changes. So we're going to keep it on Meetup and Reddit. I am thinking now because also there were requests, I am thinking of opening of one of my, um, I have boot camps in this field for machine learning and for TensorFlow. I am thinking of opening an online boot camp. Um, it's a 50 hour class. So it's something that if it happens, it'd probably be, you know, uh, for pay. I can't do for free this amount of work. Um, but I will update once it's set and if it's set. Um, yeah, and really again, thank you. This is uh, awesome for me and, um, Thank you so much for the participation, everybody. Thank you also. I re really appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to hear from you and to get more message, more info from the uh, ready to group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, oh, Shahar, I see you here. Are you still here, by the way? Everybody, Shahar is a friend of mine from real life, not from online. Yeah, I'm going to close this. Uh, thank you all. Um, have a great day. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.